which perhaps is the high point of this event. We are going to take the presentation of lecture titled The Hijab as a Metaphor of our National Aspiration. Who is Professor Isa Akintola? A lot of us must have had, maybe seen, and known him. But it will interest you to know that Professor Ishak Akintola is a professor of eschatology. Prof, you may need to explain that to us. <laughs> he currently lectures at the Lagos State University, Lasu, and he has one very, very interesting philosophy. And that philosophy is that Professor Akintola would rather remain oppressed until the hungry are fed, until the naked are clothed, until the sick are healed, and the honor, sorry, and the homeless sheltered. Allah Akbar. He established two Islamic organizations, the Muslim Right Concern, Murik and sorry for the promotion and protection of the rights of muslim women and muslim generally in nigeria and beyond and the tele dawa for the preaching of islam on television radio to public lecture and tracts today professor akil tola is a director of mori He's an ambassador of Teledawa and the coordinator of Muslim Against AIDS. Our erudite professor is always in the news on television, radio, on pages of the newspaper, and of course, some online platforms. He is no doubt an icon of great treasure, a jihad of records. Distinguished personalities, I have the singular honor and pleasure to invite to the podium Professor Isaac Akintola to deliver a lecture to us on the hijab as a metaphor of national aspiration. I pay tribute to them. And at the same time, I salute the vision of the organizers of this uh, coalition of Muslim women for putting this program together today, 6th February 2022. I want to particularly recognize the contribution and the sacrifices, the efforts made by our mother, Hajia Rahmatu, who was solely responsible for contacting me and ensuring that I come over to Abuja from Lagos. Haji Aramatu called several times, sent text messages several times, and uh, it's not easy for uh, a mother to be doing a work, taking care of the children, and also ensuring that a guest speaker attends a program like this. While I also appreciate the hospitality of the members, I want to welcome all the sisters from all the corners of this uh, vicinity to attend this, this uh, august occasion. It is indeed an auspicious program with the theme, hijab is a crown, not a crime. And uh, 
My topic this morning is the hijab as a metaphor, a metaphor of our national aspiration. And we want to ask ourselves, what are our national aspirations? What are the ideals of Nigeria as a nation? I am disadvantaged by the fact that um, I cannot, I thought standing by the podium, I will be able to see the PowerPoint as it's being displayed. You can see it. Uh, it's one angle to me, and I cannot use it. So I have, uh, I'm trying to sort it out from my, from my little phone so that um, I can keep in pace with you. Hijab is a metaphor of our national aspiration. What kind of ideals do we know as, a, as Nigerians? What do we want for our country? We talk about education for all. Education for all. That there are no out of school children. That nobody remains illiterate. That everybody can read and write. Because the more illiterate we are, the more civilized we become, and the better for the whole population. Education is the key to progress for any country. Education will give you technology. Education will give you scientific progress. Education will enable you to improve your health, your public health situation. But it is the same education that will open the door spiritually for you. The door between you and your worshiper and your, and your, and your, and your creator. Without education, you cannot know Allah. Allah says in the Hadith of Kudusi, Fa'arifuni, Qobla an ta'abuduni, wa man lam ya'rifuni, fa'kaifa ya'abuduni, a'rifuni, Qobla an ta'abuduni, know me before you worship me, fa man lam ya'rifuni, whoever does not know me, fa'kaifa ya'abuduni, how can he worship me? So, education is not just for technology, for science, for other areas of knowledge, but also for closeness between you and your creator. So, we want, this is part of the ideas we want for, for Nigeria. Technology, uh, technology could break through. We want, it's, it's part of the ideas we have for Nigeria because if we have all those gadgets that can enable us to solve worldly problems it makes life worth living it makes your job easier take for instance those days, if you wanted to call Kano from Abuja, you want to make a phone call, you will need to go to Nitel office here in Abuja to connect with the house of the person you want to call. Today, you, you sit in your office and you connect with your family in, in Kaduna. 
You sit in Mina and you connect with somebody in, uh, in Kano. You sit in Ibadan and you connect with somebody in Ekiti. From your pocket, you pick your phone. In your office, your x-ray machine is there, your scanner is there. I was going to, I was taking the train. I was going to take the train from Lagos to Ibadan for a lecture like this. About a week ago, exactly last, uh, last Sunday, and I had forgotten my identity card at home. Definitely, to purchase the ticket, they will need my ID card. And I had gotten to the train station before I remembered. That is the essence of technology. I just called my son, pick my key, go into my room, scan my, snap my ID card. My ID card, I forgot it on the table, and send it to me. And he sent it by WhatsApp. The officials at the train station were able to, they, they accepted it. That is technology. We want that for Nigeria. But how will we be able to do that without possessing other qualities? I mentioned here something like uh, a nation where things work. A nation where things work. Things like what? That we want for Nigeria. Like electricity, for instance. Like public health facilities that are up to the standard, that are up to world standard. If we have uh, electricity supply only for three hours in the day, only for two hours in the day, we will hardly be able to do much of what we want to do. You need electricity for so much, for so many things. A nation where electricity, our, uh, our, our power system, compares favorably with the standard globally. A nation where our hospital, our health, public health delivery system is reliable. You have, you have a case and you call uh, 119 or 122 or whatever number is given for emergencies and in minutes an ambulance parks in front of your house, that is public health delivery. You walk into the hospital and uh, you are attended to, you are treated like a human being, you are treated with dignity. Our pregnant women deliver safely in the clinics without much force. I mean, F U W S. That is good public health delivery. But how do we get all that? You want to check your heart, check your kidney? Those facilities are there. The laboratories are equipped. Drugs are available in the hospitals. That is good public health facility. But you cannot get all that without good citizenship. Because the, the medical doctors, those, the officials in the hospital, communication officials, 
those who are building the roads, they are part of the population. And whatever affects or whatever is common among the people will be common among them. Well, we also want a nation, a nation that, a nation where lives and properties are protected. A nation where lives and properties are protected. That will make you proud of your country. But it has to be done in a responsible way. Because one thing we need to know is that security is uh, something that must be shared generally. Security is not for the police alone. Security is not for the army alone. Neither is it for the DSS alone. They cannot, they are the officials, they are the authorities. But they are like, uh, how do I describe it? They are like, uh, like, like an engine that needs to be given fuel in order to, to function. You can't start your car without petrol. Your car is good, the engine is good, you, and the key is with you. So, the soldiers, the policemen, other security officials, they are in charge of our security vehicles. Call security a vehicle. They are in charge. But the fuel is in your hands. The fuel is in your tanks. The fuel is in your petrol stations. It is the citizens who will supply the fuel. That fuel is information. If we don't work with the security agencies, they cannot function properly. They need our support. They need our encouragement. They need our input. It is an irresponsible citizenry that mocks its security agency. It is an irresponsible population that destroys the facilities of the security, like police stations, like army barracks, like burning a police vehicle, like killing security agencies. It is the height of irresponsible citizenry. The ideals of Nigeria as a nation. Well, before I leave the, the issue of security, while the army, the police, and uh, other agencies of security are working, NSCDC and co, and the citizens supply information, the responsibility to give orders and to ensure that the security agencies work properly and effectively does not lie with the president of the country alone. Nigeria is a federation and we have 36 states. We also have I think uh, 170, is it 177 or 174 local governments? 700. 700. 774. 774 local governments. Every local government has a stake because every local government has a chairman. He should take care of the security of his local government. Every governor, every state has a governor. There are 36 governors. And every governor has a stake in his state. So, 
the governor has the responsibility to support security agencies in his state and so as to ensure that they, 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 they are able to work. Apart from that, funds, what you call security vote, that the governor receives every month. We don't know how much. Is it in, the, in, in their billions or is it in the millions? But whatever it is, that money is not meant for, for, uh, for merrymaking. It's meant for the promotion and support of security in every state. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, what we have is a situation where everybody expects Abuja only to be in charge of security. Abuja only to be blamed for any issue of insecurity. If our governors, if the 36 governors will wake up and build a security network, a formidable ne security network to support the army, to support the police, to support the NSCDC, the, the problem of insecurity which we have currently will be reduced to the barest minimum. What are the ideals of Nigeria as, as a nation? A nation imbued with uh, taqwa, the fear of Allah, saturated with love, and of course permeated by patriotism. If all of us allow love to spread around, Nigeria will be a better place. Metaphorically, that is what hijab stands for. Hijab is a symbol of love. Hijab brings you closer to humanity than you ever thought before. That you are wearing hijab, that a woman has hijab on her head, means she's a responsible woman. A woman prepared to play the role that all women globally should play. That is to build a nation. To be the mother of a nation. Because every, every single woman is the mother of a nation. And when you educate just one, you educate a, a whole country. When, when you discriminate against a single woman, wearing hijab or not using hijab, you've discriminated against a whole nation. Because that woman you are discriminating against may be the mother of seven, mother of eight, mother of four. And among our children, we may have a governor tomorrow. Among our children, we may have a head of state, a president tomorrow. All the men in this hall were born by women, including me. That is why men must continue to treat women like coins with love, with respect, and with adoration.
through the philosophy of hijab, the ideal of Nigeria as a nation is one of a disciplined society in the philosophy of hijab. A society that encourages the, the, the wearing of hijab is encouraging decency, is encouraging discipline. And this discipline is not just about uh, listening to your father or listening to your mother or listening, apart from listening to the husband, obeying the husband, and the husband also respecting the wife. It, it saturates down to society. In some areas, even in Abuja here, if not, some of you may not have been to Lagos, but you need to see the craze, the insanity in Lagos traffic. Even where there is no traffic, downfall drivers will park in the middle of the road, doing nothing. And every, there, may be no, there may be no vehicle in front of him at all. Several vehicles would have been delayed at the back, but it doesn't, the driver doesn't care. The Okada rider will come to the middle of the road and block it there and wait for, for passengers. Particularly with, in, the, in this age of impunity, nobody calls the Okada rider and the, 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 the lawless downfall driver to order. And uh, the law-abiding citizens in, the, in, in society are made, they remain sad. They remain helpless. When we talk about a disciplined society, it goes around. A disciplined society is a morally upright society. And hijab is the key to morality. The hijab wearing woman is 24-7 conscious of her responsibility, of her identity. No, I should not be seen doing this. No, I will never encourage this. In a place of work, in particular, she's a guiding light. The indiscipline in our society today is... Uh, it's excruciatingly painful even to discuss, to mention. It pains the heart. Uh, we don't have uh, too much time to, to, to spend on that. Uh, I will go to the... Uh, uh, yes, one, uh, another ideal of Nigeria, which is food self sufficiency. If Nigeria is going to be a sovereign nation, a truly sovereign nation, where the citizens will be free of hunger, then we must have food self-sufficiency. It is part of the ideals that we know as a nation. And every Ijabite, the woman in Ijab, has a role to play in that. We talk of uh, uh, we talk of um, petty farming, petty farming in our homes, in our backyard, behind the window. You, our mothers, 
you can you can do without stopping out of the compound to get the things you will use for for the ingredients for cooking you can get a vegetable within the compound you can do a little bit of uh, fish pond farming the hijabite that is the woman using hijab must think with vision must think be, you know, into the future, not just about the present. How, how can Nigeria be food sufficient? It's not about going to farm alone. But then, even the Ijabite has another role to play. When the food, when, when the farmers even bring these products, how do we market them responsibly? The price the, the price of gari, the price of yam, the price of other products, other food items, sometimes skyrocket beyond what is, what is imaginable. And sometimes it is some, uh, uh, some Nigerians who, are, who, who lack discipline who cause it. Of course, hijab in its philosophy acts as a as a as a as a caution as a machinery that stops recklessness people want to people enjoy profiteering they increase prices um, at will because to them what matters is what gets into their pockets but to the Ijabite it must be humanity first my fellow Nigerian first food for Nigeria first from Kano I have seen the Amira the National Amira of Fongwan Sister, uh, Sister Alajas, Aji Asoni, Rafi Asoni. She's from, she came all the way from your state. So the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Fulani woman, the Kanuri woman, and the Aousa woman, come together and get identified. They get united through the hijab. Hijab has become our rallying point nationally. But when you go, when you travel out also, or when other nationals, when people from outside Nigeria, women from outside Nigeria, British, Americans, Canadians, when they come to Nigeria and mix with us, that is international unification. The kind of, the feeling of uh, camaraderie that we are colleagues, that we are sisters, moves us closer, ties us together. But that identity through the hijab is strong is the strongest a job is also color blind among us here we have the fair we have the we have the black but globally when you attend conferences outside Nigeria or seminars outside, Niger outside the country, you mix with whites, you mix with colored people, people from Muslims from India, from Indonesia, from Egypt, 
from all other continents, Americans, Britons, hijab will not separate any of you, any color. And of course, for reflection, I call attention to Quran chapter 49, Surah Al-Hujurat, verse 13, where Allah says, Bismillah rahman rahim Ya ayu anas, inna khalaknakum min zakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shi'uban wa kubaila lita'arrafu, inna akramakum inda Allahi atikokum. O mankind, we have created you from one single inna khalaknakum min zakarin wa untha from males, from a male and a female. Of course, you know the interpretation of that. And we made you into peoples and nations that is on different continents. Africa, Asia. Europe, the Americans, South and North, Lita Arrafu, for the purpose of uh, being kind to one another. Some people interpret that as for the purpose of knowing one another. It's the same thing. Because when you know people, you, you, are, you are bound to be kind to them. In the Akramakum in the Lahi Atikokum. But among you all, the best among you are those who fear Allah. And the symbol of the fear of Allah is this hijab. My sister, I want you to look at the sister sitting next to you and tell her, Alhamdulillah, you are a Muslim. The Quran has identified us here that in the Akramakum in the Lahi Atikokum, out there on the street, they may be going out in uh, in uh, open chests, they may be going out in backless with nothing at the back on the streets they may be going out in short very short knickers crazy short knickers or with tattered jeans jeans that are already cut and women wear it to show their legs to show their thighs But the descent, the God-fearing, the chest that dignified put on the hijab, they are not after any glamour, they are not after any advertisement, they are not dressed to kill anyone. I thank Allah for your lives. Another verse used there is in Korean chapter 21, verse 92, uh, which says, In the name of Allah, the This, your nation, is just one nation, from wherever you may come from. With your hijab on your head, with your hijab over you, you are dignified. You have honor. I have a short story to tell. There was this uh, commercial boss. People feel, people, you know, uh, in Lagos, 
it's uh, almost always 99 standing, 17 sitting. A lot of people will be standing because uh, uh, commercial vehicles are very, are very scarce. So this lady was standing and she was in a jail. She was among those who were standing, holding a pole in the, in the bus to be stable. And uh, a, a cleric, a Christian cleric, a pastor, was among those who were sitting. He just looked at the sister and said, my sister, come, come and sit down, come and take my seat. Meanwhile, there was another lady who was dressed like uh, the, uh, those from the other side. She was advertising herself. She was almost, she was half naked. When the pastor stood up and said, uh, sister, please come and sit down, come and have my seat. She was the one that rushed to the pastor's seat. The pastor said, sorry, I'm talking to this woman who is decently dressed. So they also know it that you are decently dressed. They know it. And uh, it's uh, towards the end of my lecture here, I don't know how much time I still have. Five minutes. Uh, towards the end of my lecture here, did you say I have five minutes? Yes. Towards the end of my lecture here, I'm going to jump so many, uh, so many points so that I, I, don't, I don't enjoy uh, spending more than the time allotted to me. Uh, it is part of discipline. Towards the end of this lecture, I cited the example of the use of hijab even in the Bible. How the Bible enjoys the covering of the head. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. No, verses 4 to 11, because it's about seven verses. And the Bible goes on to say something like, uh, they are instructed to cover that way because, because of the angels. And this is exactly what uh, our scholars have been saying. Cover your head. Don't move around. A, wo a woman should not move around with her head bare. Um, while in some, area, in some parts of Nigeria, there is this hostility towards the woman that is wearing hijab. You have challenges, particularly when you go for capture. When you, uh, they call it capturing. You want to obtain the international passport. You want to get a driving license. You want to uh, get a voter's registration card. NIN. All those areas, all those places where you need to do capturing, they give the hijabite problem. And that is an area where we are calling on, we have been calling on government to, to facilitate the capturing of Muslim women such that they will not be humiliated, they will not be intimidated. Because Nigeria it's a multicultural country. And all these cultures have their own ways of dressing, have their own ways of life. Hijab is a Muslim way, <coughs> the Muslim way of life, which must be respected by those who are in a position of authority. It is disturbing that officials of uh, FRSC and the immigration who claim to be ignorant of the fact that Muslim women cover their heads. And in the process of capturing, they frustrate our women. In particular, during uh, voters' registration. And that is very, very strategic. Because 
when our women are not allowed to register with their hijab on their heads, when they are chased away, they are being disenfranchised. And disenfranchisement is, uh, is uh, against the spirit of democracy. Muslims are in the majority in this country. If the Muslim women are not allowed to register during elections, it means more than three quarters of our population, of the Muslim population, have been, have been, uh, have been uh, uh, cut off, have been rendered redundant, unable to vote. And we are crying out against this practice. It must not happen again. Particularly the 2023 election that is coming. Our, 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 our officials in government, the leaders in government, the leaders in politics should drive this point home to registration officials. Every Nigerian, every Nigerian has a right to vote. And if he has a right to vote, he has a right to be registered. If you see from the slides here, there are, you can see pictures of British police women who are Muslims. And the British allowed them to, they are, they are allowed to use hijab. Canadian policemen, police women, they use hijab once they are Muslims. When will this be allowed in the Nigerian police. When will this be allowed in the Nigerian army? The question is, is Nigeria, are we in the, in the stone age or do we want to move with the global society? The question is, the, uh, the other issue is, who are those who are, who are determined to continue to to, to, who are those who are determined to continue to oppress and persecute Muslim women in Nigeria? A very important update. Just four days ago, on Thursday, students of Oyun Baptist High School had to go on demonstration because they were not allowed to use hijab in their school. The law allows it. The Constitution of Nigeria allows it. Section 38 of Sections 1 and 2 of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. But those school authorities refused to honor it, refused to, uh, uh, to recognize the Constitution. And when you refuse to accept the constitution, the people can go to court. When, we, when those areas go to court, they are ignored. The courts continue to postpone, to adjourn, and adjourn, and adjourn. In the process, the, Muslim, uh, the Muslims are frustrated. So they, they, went on, uh, they, they, they went on the streets on Thursday, and in the process of a peaceful pro uh, protest, one of the students was shot dead and about four others were injured. We understand that the police in Kwara State, that was in, 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 in Oyo, Kwara State, we understand they are yet to make a single arrest. Those who attacked these students and shot at them were hoodlums, thugs and hooligans, hired by the authorities of Baptist High School. Don't you? And the Christian Association of Nigeria of Kora State sponsored them because they insisted that they would not allow any single girl, any single Muslim girl, to use hijab. 
uh, I am indeed proud of this gathering. I want to congratulate you for coming together to mark World Hijab Day. I congratulate in particular the Amira of Coalition of Muslim Women and our executive. And I also say th uh, a big thank you to Ajia Rahmatu who toiled night and day to ensure that this, uh, to ensure that I come over here today. I want to thank you and I, I, I have an apology to tender because my lecture has been poor today because I had no access to what I had prepared. I, where I'm standing, I repeat it, I cannot see. I just managed to use my phone to trace out one or two things. Uh, may Almighty Allah continue to promote and protect all of you. Hijab is a crown. It is not a crime.